Norman Mailer, for nearly 50 years we've thought of you as one of the great writers of our time. Books like The Naked and the Dead, The Armies of the Night, The Executioner's Song, and now a new book, an acclaimed new book, Oswald's Tale, a book about John Kennedy's uh, assassin. It's a hell of a big book. What impelled you to tackle that subject? I uh, have to confess that I was fascinated with that assassination from November 22nd, 1963 on. And in, indeed, uh, even before the Warren Commission report came out, I approached a few fellow writers and said, you know, we, we really ought to start a literary commission and see if we can get some kind of power of subpoena that have, let Edmund Wilson be the head of it, Dwight McDonald be the interrogator, and so forth, and, and see what we can do with it. I couldn't rouse any interest and let it go. And then years later, I belonged to something called the Dynamite Club, which was a group of us. We were all writers on assassination, conspiracy, uh, stuff of that sort, CIA. And uh, so I've always been fascinated with Oswald, read a great many books about the subject over the years. But then uh, my old colleague on the Executioner song, Larry Schiller, came along. He'd been living in Russia off and on for a few years. And he, he said to me, you know, I think I can get the uh, KGB file on Oswald. Uh, Larry's one of those people who can get things that no one else can get. So uh, I said, wonderful, if you can, I'll, I'll, I'll go over there and we'll do a book about Oswald and Minsk. Well, uh, we got the file and then we didn't have the file. We did have it because the KGB was running into all sorts of troubles. The year was, I think, 1992. And in Belarus, which was a new republic at the Cold War, they were terrified of, uh, 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 of what had happened with the Stasi in East Germany, where all the sources began to scream and complain because they were being exposed. So they stopped giving us the file. And then they promised to give us the file. And the government wanted them to give us the file. So it went back and forth, and we obtained files from bit by bit. But in the course of it, we also were interviewing everyone who'd known Oswald when he was there. And there were wonderful interviews since uh, the KGB had told them uh, not to say a word after the assassination. KGB had decided back in 61, 62 that Oswald was harmless. And therefore they felt it was a provocation by America to start a world war. So they didn't want anyone talking about Oswald. Who, uh, did, who did the research, Schiller or you? No, we both did it. We'd interview people together. Uh, we have different styles of interview and it works very well. And sometimes it didn't work well. Sometimes we'd fight. But once in a while we'd get very angry at one another and you'd have this poor Russian <coughs> sitting there looking at the translator with his eyes or her eyes wide open while we're fighting back and forth and arguing over how the interview should continue. But generally we worked together quite well and, uh, and got the material. And you the, do I, the... I want to make one point though on this, which is that because the KGB had told everyone not to say anything for 30 years, what went on when we started to interview them, because now they could speak, was that their memories were fresh. We were dealing with mint memories because everyone had done nothing but think for 30 years about Oswald a after the assassination. Does the book consist, uh, in your view, wholly of research collated and presented, or is there a novelist's insight at work on the character of Oswald? Well, you hope there's always a novelist's insight at work. Uh, you know, I think of novelists as being very a very special breed of uh, human being. We're somewhere between uh, psychologists, historians, detectives, uh, 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 students of style and manner. Uh, we have a capacity to do things that other people don't. Most people are experts and they've got to find out one aspect or another of a person. We, we, we develop over the years to try to see someone whole. And Oswald is such a peculiar, complex man that no one's ever tried to understand him. And, and I had the opportunity to, to make a real attempt at it. Is the book in any sense a work of fiction? No. Wherever I was speculating, and I speculate often, particularly in the second half of the book, I announce that to the reader. That's not fiction. At least that's not fiction in nonfiction. Fiction in nonfiction is when you have people saying things and there's no way you can ever know whether they said that or not. That's, that's awful in nonfiction. But you have a perfect right to say to the reader, at this point, we're going to suppose this conversation took place and for the following reasons. But you make it clear that there's no guarantee it took place. The tone of voice in the book, and there is an authorial tone of voice in the book, is very sparse and elegant, very unlike the very rumbuctuous way, uh, fruity sort of way of your earlier periods. Is that a, I mean, I find that also in the execution of song. Is that a, a deliberate decision? By fruity, do you, do you mean gay or no. fruity like a wine? 
fruity like a wine. <laughs> uh, I, I like to think that I can write in uh, reasonably well in a dozen styles. In fact, that's why, just to, to parenthetically, that's why I, I've always been fascinated with Picasso, because he showed me that, uh, well, not that I compare myself next to Picasso, to Picasso right. but he did show me that you can, uh, you can write, you can work in many, many styles and still be true to some final part of yourself. Uh, so this is a style for me. I, I can work in several styles. You mentioned Picasso, and you've just uh, published uh, a, a study of him. You've written about him, about John Kennedy and Oswald and Marilyn Monroe. Is there something for you in these larger-than-life, real-life characters that have an audience appeal, as it were, that more than the character of a novelist's invention can have? You're right. It's, it's fascinating for that reason, which is they are like characters in novels and that they're larger than life. But also, I have, in a funny way, I have a certain, uh, a certain, I may have a certain competence to deal with such people because in a much smaller way, I've been a celebrity myself. But I understand one element of celebrity, which is the unreality of it. After all, at the age of 25, I went from being someone who was the kid next door in, in a, many, many ways to uh, being called a major American writer. And, you know, that's a role you don't, just don't fit at the age of 25. And I used to go around saying, you know, I feel like I'm secretary to someone named Norman Mailer, and uh, to meet him, people have to meet me first. Uh, there I was, modest little fellow, you see, in front of uh, the, the huge reputation, the early huge reputation. And, and uh, that, that gives you an insight into celebrity. I feel comfortable with them when, when I interview them. You, you know, I've interviewed uh, also uh, Warren Beatty and Madonna, and it works uh, because I understand things about them that most people couldn't begin to comprehend. But the advantage to you as a writer is also that there's an interest in them before you put your version of them before Ab the public. Absolutely. It, 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 every bit helps, as Floyd Patterson once said. <laughs> but are there truths that only fiction can tell? I think you said that too. Well, of course. Uh, there are, given the rules of, uh, of, of nonfiction writing, uh, Fiction can tell you certain truths that no one, nothing else can. For instance, Oswald's tale, I went in for certain speculations on Oswald. One was whether he'd had a homosexual background, and that was all speculation. There's no proof of it. There's a lot of subtle evidence of it, but not real proof. Uh, and his wife, by the way, doesn't think he was ever homosexual. So, you, you know, it's, it's a complex matter there. Is he, isn't he? And then also there was a remote possibility, maybe one in 20, that he did kill a Marine while uh, overseas. So given all that, I, I thought, well, why am I doing this? Because it felt right as I was doing it. And I knew I'd be caught short on it. You know, the critics would say, how dare he do this? But in fact, if you stop to think about it, it makes them more real. Because when we know people, uh, we, we hear something about a friend that's bizarre. But nonetheless, it enters our thought. Did our friend really do this or that that they, we, told, we were told they did? And this becomes part of our comprehension of people. If we stop and think for a moment, we realize, there's no one that we know inside out. There's always an area that we know, there's an area that we know less well, and there's a speculative area at the outside. And, and that's part of the roundness of people that we live with. And when you do it in a book, the person becomes more real. At the end of the, the writing of the book, how sure were you that Oswald did it? I said 75% certain, and no more than that, no more. If someone came along with incontrovertible proof that he was part of a conspiracy, or that he didn't pull the trigger, I'd say, well, I was absolutely in error on that. I, I think he did it. There's a lot of evidence that he didn't do it. If I'd been his lawyer and I were a good defense lawyer, I could have gotten him off, no question. Because you'd have to explain the magic bullet, the prosecution would have to explain the magic bullet, which is very hard for people to believe. They'd have to uh, uh, account for the fact that he was able to shoot well. A lot, you know, they, they, much would be made by the defense of the fact that in Russia, he'd once fired at a, uh, a rabbit from 10 feet away with a shotgun and missed. So um, all these, uh, as I say, 75% certain is all I'll claim. But his character was such that he could have done it. That was the conclusion I came to. And his character was such that he could have wanted to do it? Well, wanted to do it in the sense that he, it wasn't that he hated Kennedy. Kennedy was almost an accident. You, you know, he was an executioner at that point. He wanted to execute an enormous historical figure and thereby enter history forever. And, and indeed, he succeeded. If we take a long look back over the fiction of 200 years, the novel, and a bit, bit more than 200 years, is violence 
the American subject? Well, we are a violent nation. There's just no question about it. I mean, I mean, every all nations are violent in, in their onset. I mean, that's all. The British were pretty bloody. Go back a thousand years, and you know, we don't have to worry about that. And, and certainly, uh, northern blood does make for as southern blood. <laughs> all blood seems to make for a good deal of violence. But America's a young country, and it's a huge country. And we've been defining ourselves from the moment we began. And we began in rebellion. We began with a huge notion of freedom. And uh, we hated government interference from the word go, from the moment of the Revolutionary War in, in the 18th century. So violence is natural to America, yes. In uh, More natural than a lot of your writing in the American Dream in The White Negro, you seem to make a connection between creativity and violence. Do you? I've always found them closely related in myself. In other words, I've often found that uh, uh, I have to get, I have to find some way to drain the violence of myself in order to be able to work well. Now, you don't have to go around uh, injuring people all the time in order to drain the violence in yourself. One of the reasons I got interested in boxing is that was a good way to do it. I mean, you paid a price for it. If you box on Saturday morning, you always had a headache on Saturday afternoon. But, but in fact, it, 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 uh, it was a nice way to do it. In boxing, did you enjoy slugging the other guy, or did you maybe enjoy getting slugged back yourself? No, I, I found when I was boxing, that's why I was boxing with amateurs who were about my level, that uh, the odd thing about boxing is you hardly feel, you don't feel any pain while you're boxing. You feel headache to a degree. You feel concussion against your head or your stomach, but you're in reasonable shape. And no, I didn't feel bad. I, I didn't enjoy getting hit, but I didn't mind it. Uh, and hitting other people, it's all moving so fast that you, you know, you hardly can stop and take a bow because you hit someone. He's hitting you back the next moment. So you're not thinking of, wow, what a beautiful shot I landed. You're thinking of, uh, if you're thinking at all, and you shouldn't be, you should be doing it instinctively, you're thinking about covering up for the, for the counterpunch. I mean, staying with the, the, the violence uh, in American life, I can see that it's an important aspect of American life. But why do we enjoy reading about it? Well, because it's the last frontier in literature. You know, Jane Austen took care of manners beautifully. Uh, it's hard, uh, Henry James, it's hard really to write about manners at this point in civilization where manners are all over the place and hideously scattered uh, with any real skill. Uh, people have tried it, Donald Bartle may try it, uh, other people have tried it, and it's interesting, but it's not the frontier. The frontier is violence because it's very hard to write about. Very few people, uh, writers are sensitive people, private people. Uh, they tend to draw back from violence. So I found it interesting because it was something I could do that many other people couldn't do. When you reviewed Brett Easton Ellis's uh, American Psycho, you seem to be asking yourself uh, rather the opposite of what you've just said, whether the violence that he writes about uh, was a permissible subject for a writer. Well, I felt he went too far for too little. In other words, I felt he was using up our liberties. I, I think if you're going to get into the kind of carnage that he had in that book, after all, he had a man with a chainsaw sawing parts off a woman. I mean, that's pretty hideous stuff. That's not my idea of violence. That's, if you will, is uh, ultra-violence or super-violence or, or, or whatever you want to call it. But it's beyond what I think of as violence in writing. But uh, I'm interested in one man fighting another or somebody possibly committing a murder. That, that's within, you might say, that's within the, the enclave permissible for writing about violence. When you get into more than that, you've got to truly analyze the person the, 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 the malefactor. What's the use of reading about somebody doing those hideous things unless you get more understanding of, of why that person was doing it and what was going through their mind as they were doing it? And his book was numb in that, in that regard, and therefore I, I was disapproved. But you said that he showed us where the hands on the clock have got to now, he, as if he had his finger on the pulse of what's happening. He had in... his finger on the pulse of what you can get away with, uh, because he was at the very edge of it. He almost didn't get away with it. But I thought he was using up our liberty, you see. So I wasn't, I hardly approved of the book. I thought he was, he was he's a very good writer in certain ways and a very dull writer in other ways. And uh, I thought it was a, a job of literary criticism was very much in order. But you would say that the writer's job is to be on that frontier? Well, not, not the only writer's job. Certain writers are good for that, to be on the frontier. Other writers are extremely substantial and wonderful and poetic. Uh, John Updike, there's no reason for John Updike to be on the frontier. He's extraordinarily good at what he does, and I wouldn't it's say he should do something else. sex in sex, and sex in married life, perhaps. Well, since I've never written much about sex and married life, it, it's too tricky a subject.
you know, uh, how are you going to do it without uh, losing a mate? In the 50s and 60s, you lived a very public and a pretty rackety life. What rackety? Rackety. Rackety. rackety? What's a rackety life? Well, you, you <laughs> boozed like and an you old street brawled car? and you, you kind of uh, stumbled around thumping people. What became of Mail of the Barroom Brawler? Well, uh, he was willing to go on, but the joints and the bones weren't. Uh, uh, I began to pay more and more for the hangovers. So I thought, it's, I never, uh, you know, I've never been an AA type. Uh, I just uh, started drinking a little less. And then a couple of periods on my own, I cut it out once drinking for a year and a half, and again another time for a year, and uh, you know, about 10 years later. And I found each time when I went back, I was drinking less. So now, you know, uh, you'd be amazed what a modest uh, tippler I am. A drink or two a, a night is plenty, and I can go three days without thinking of it. The, in the, the, the were, there was a famous incident when you head-butted um, Gore Vidal. Do those Listen, old... Gore Vidal and I have made up. That's what and I, I want to say, you. I don't want to waste my time and his time starting a new war. I just wanted to know whether you'd made up or not. Yes, yes, well, yes. We, we decided that uh, since half of our politics were in agreement, there was no use fighting one another and giving great pleasure to the uh, right wing of American political life. Did so all we are formally, uh, it's sort of like Rabin and Arafat. Did all that uh, stuff help your writing or hinder it? It did both. Most of the things you do in your life are good for you and bad for you. Don't forget, we're all divided souls. We've, we've got two natures in us. You know, that's one of my favorite ideas. That we have two natures in us. And you measure schizophrenia not by the fact that you're divided, but how, how well do the, do, do, the, do the divisions speak to one another? You know, like the health of a country is kind of the two rival parties communicate at all. Same with people. And uh, so I have rival parties in me. And uh, one part carouses, and the other part is monkish and serious and disciplined. How else would I do the work if I were drunk every night? Where do you get the energy to do this work? My mother loved me. That gives energy. Oh, boy, does it. Where were you born? I born in New Jersey, Long Branch, New Jersey, which is on the Atlantic Sea Coast. And uh, it's about 50 miles from New York, and I grew up in Brooklyn. Who was your father? My father, by the way, was a British provincial. He came from South Africa. Uh, he went to London in the First World War. He was an accountant. Came to America afterward to visit his sister, who had migrated from South Africa. Met my mother and married. But he always had an English accent, the way a South African colonial will have an English accent. And that accounts for the staccato quality of uh, my voice because uh, I have my father's rhythms when I speak. And you know South Africans, they, you ask them what kind of cigarette they smoke, and they say, Springbok. Was he uh, a formative influence in your life? Very much, but uh, on the margin, because um, he was a small, natty man. Uh, he looked like a responsible official in a bank, and he was a prodigious gambler. If, if we hadn't had one re wealthy relative who bailed him out, uh, he would have ended up in jail. He was a marvelous fellow. He had huge style. And I loved him, but from a distance, because he was an odd man, terribly private. My mother, who was wrecked and all there all the time, used to go mad because she couldn't understand gambling and would wreck our life periodically. Every two or three years, there'd be a crisis. Did she hold the home together? Absolutely, oh, yeah. But he was a decent fellow. You, you know, everyone adored him because he was, he was so nice and gentle. It was just he had this mad streak in him. Was your mother very protective of you? You just said she was Overprotective. Really. Overprotective. I never forgave her for it. You uh, know, that's the one thing about being loved by your mother. Uh, there's a price on that one, too. Well, one of your wives said she couldn't understand she married this marvelous author, and uh, he wanted to go home and have supper with his mother every Friday night. Well, you know, ex-wives do, do it in a way <laughs> to characterize a relationship that will give the ex-husband the least energy possible. <laughs> uh, no, I, it wasn't quite like that. You know, uh, by, the time I, by that time, my mother was fairly old, but she still was the best cook I knew, so it was fun to go by there and eat, but uh, it was hardly that I, you, you know, that's what I lived for, was to go home to Mom. Your, your middle name in Hebrew means king. Yes, that's my father's doing. They treat you like a king? A little prince, yes. You had a happy childhood? No, when you're treated like a little prince, you can't have a happy childhood. I had a spoiled childhood, but, but I wouldn't say it was happy. It was half happy. Enjoy your schooling? I was bright, so I enjoyed that. But I also was, um, I wasn't good enough at sports in the early days. And so if you're not good at sports, you can hardly enjoy your schooling altogether. Your childhood was, you were brought up through the Depression. Was that tough on the family? 
Your father? Well, worked. it was it was it was like a Chaplin movie. You know, my father would be unemployed at times, and he'd come home. And you know, he, as I say, he was a natty man. He'd wear spats in the middle of the depression, and he, he you know, he'd have a cane, and he really was nicely dressed. And uh, he'd come home, and um, my sister, who was four years younger than myself, and I would we'd run toward him as he came to the door and say, "Did you get a job today, Daddy?" And then he'd look at us and, and go. It was just like a Chaplin movie, you know, the man comes home and the children want to know if he got work and he has to say no. How Jewish was your upbringing? I'd say medium. Uh, to wit, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side had been intensely religious and had been in the synagogue and, and uh, uh, he was uh, a butcher, but he also could have been a rabbi. You know, he was both a little in a small Jersey town. And uh, he was intensely orthodox. My mother was just practically orthodox. You know, she kept a kosher house and so forth. Uh, my father respected it. He was a gambler, you, you know. Now, don't argue with anything that might get in the way of the gambling. Have you clung to your Jewish? No, you I, I'm, I'm very Jewish, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, in that I have a Jewish temperament, I have a Jewish mind. I think those couple of thousand years did produce a certain style of mind. Uh, there's, you know, I'm inquiring and I'm fascinated with the dialectic. I'm, I'm fascinated with an argument, the counter-argument, and then the argument that comes out of the counter-argument. And I love that. I live with that. Uh, I'm not at all pious. Uh, I'm superstitious to that degree. I'm a little bit of an Orthodox Jew, but not at all in that I can't bear, uh, I'm not close to the ceremonies. Uh, I, I'm in no way a, a, a formal Jew, but I, in every way I consider myself Jewish. And Saul Bellow and Arthur Miller and Philip Roth, all of roughly a generation. How have so many American writers of our day had this background? I think something was coming to turn. In, in other words, we were all second and third generation Jewish Americans. And at that point, there was enough, what can I say, enough surplus, enough leisure, uh, and enough uh, immersion in American culture to produce an exciting uh, confrontation between one's own native Jewish culture and the American culture. And those of us who had literary gifts were, were sort of shot into literary space with it. And, and so that's, I think that was the generation where, where Jewish writers just blossomed. There, there may not be another one ever, who knows. You went to Harvard and studied aeronautical engineering. Why did you do that? I built model airplanes all through my youth and I thought I wanted to be an aer aeronautical engineer. And I got to Harvard and discovered I was more interested in writing. So I took a minimum of courses in engineering and then took all the courses I wanted to take, including one on modern art where I discovered Picasso. And in 1944, you went into the army. Yes. Did you see active service? Yes, not heavy service. I, was, uh, I ended up a rifleman in a reconnaissance outfit. We used to go on a lot of patrols. We'd go three, four, five patrols you a week. shot at? Yes, once or twice, but nothing, uh, nothing memorable. I mean, I did not have heavy combat. Yeah. What did you learn from your war service? I learned, that, uh, I learned a lot of things that were immensely valuable for... Uh, uh, for my writing. Uh, one of them, I learned that I was a, oh, an absolutely ordinary soldier. If you had 12 soldiers in a platoon, I'd be fourth or fifth from the bottom in terms of abilities. I learned that the common man was not common, that he had an extraordinary number of gifts, and that we were all were truly equal. I mean, I must say it left me with a feeling of great equality with other people. I, I do not consider myself superior to other people because I learned at an early age that one's not. Uh, I also ended up with a lot of... Uh, uh, self-contempt because I hadn't been a good enough soldier and I wanted to be and, and that drove me in later years to uh, go into what are falsely called macho pursuits. The Naked and the Dead, your war novel, your first big published novel, was a huge success. Was that good for you? Well, it, it uh, shot me into a space, you might say, into celebrity space and uh, things were never the same again and it took 20 years before I realized that where I, before I stopped pitying myself and saying, oh, I've been cut off from normal experience. I'll never know what it's like to work in an ordinary job and all that. It took 20 years before I finally said to myself, look, this is your experience. This is the only experience you're going to have, perhaps. And so uh, live with it and work with it. And at about that, that time, I think I began to get interested in what are the real questions for me, given my experience. And that is identity, questions of identity. What is identity? Do, do we have one identity or many? If you have many identities, is that a sign of uh, impossible instability or, or can it be lived with and, and so forth. I mean, the questions were interesting. And they, 
they, I think they inform to, my later work. And did you try to live out the answers to this, the search to the, for the answers to Well, this you can't live out all the questions. You live out a few of them. The next two books were not so successful, uh, Barbie Shore and Deer Park. But you were well, they were half growth? successful. Uh, Barbie Shore was a failure. Yeah. A terrible review. Uh, the Deer Park got some very good reviews, yeah. along with some very bad ones. Yeah. But was that a setback that it wasn't, it couldn't cap Naked in the Dead straight off? It, it, it certainly wasn't an improvement on things. You went to Hollywood. What did you make of that? I went there to, you know, I'd gone into the army with the idea I'm going to write a great novel. <coughs> oh, excuse me, write a great novel about the war. And I'd half succeeded, so uh, I thought I'll go out to Hollywood and write a novel about Hollywood. And I went out there in 49, 50 and spent a year there. And I came back and started the, the Deer Park. Did you like what you saw in Hollywood? No, very few people like Hollywood. You know, making movies is extraordinarily exciting and huge fun, more fun than you have doing anything else. But very few people like Hollywood. It's not a nice place. Uh, Los Angeles is not my favorite city by any means. I mean, I'd rather live in London than Los Angeles, I promise you. In the 50s and 60s, I mean, you were very much a public figure. You were an activist. You, were, you put yourself about a lot. Did the, somebody said that the performing self had taken over from the writer and there were 10 years without a new work of fiction? Well, uh, there was a lot going on. And yes, there wasn't a new work of fiction. So what? <laughs> I mean, I've been writing for 50 years. I'm entitled to a couple of blank spaces. But what was the attraction to you of uh, the television and the reportage and the running for mayor and all the things you did in the public eye? Don't forget, I wrote a novel before I ran for mayor. So, I mean, you can't mix the period. The periods are complicated. But I was acquiring experience. I was acquiring the experience of a celebrity, if you will. In other words, I'd come to that understanding that I was willy-nilly uh, somewhere between, um, I was not quite a major celebrity, certainly. I wasn't totally a minor celebrity. I was in some no man's land of celebrityhood. But this was my experience, and this is what I was going to live with, and so I might as well use it. Was so it? I used it because it gave me experience. It gave me an understanding of how the world works. What, what happens, let me, let me just finish this point, because I think it's crucial. The trouble with having that early celebrity is that you get absolutely obsessed with yourself, which is finally uh, a sterile occupation. Uh, it's not, it doesn't produce good work. It's too narcissistic. And you have to work your way through that so you're no longer interested in yourself. There was a time when I was absolutely fascinated with myself. By now I'm bored with myself. I'm much more interested in how the world works than how I work. I've learned how I work. Now I want to learn how the world works. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, is trying to understand the world trying to understand people like Gary Gilmore, who, who uh, killed two people and wanted to be executed himself. How does the penal system work? How does the system of justice work? That was one book. I tr tried to understand the CIA. I even tried to understand how ancient Egypt worked. You know, I tried to understand how um, the Cold War worked through Oswald. I've always been trying to, s over, uh, over these years, my interest is not in how I work, but how the world uh, shapes itself. What is the machine of the world like? Where do you write? Well, I work a lot in Provincetown now, uh, up on the Cape. I live there more than I live in New York. I have a little studio in New York where I work, and uh, I have a, a one in Provincetown on the top floor of the house. Do you do a daily stint? When I'm working on a book, absolutely. I work every day. Starting uh, when? Hmm? Starting when? Oh, usually late in the morning. And um, then I'll, when I'm working hard, I'll work two, 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 twice a day. I'll work for a couple of hours, have lunch, uh, take a nap work again for a couple of hours. You can get an awful lot done in four hours. Do you write or type? I write longhand. And then I have an assistant who types it up for me. Do you care about reviews? Yes, they affect your wallet in the most direct fashion. And, uh, actually, I was introduced to General Powell <coughs> a couple of weeks ago, and Harry Evans, the publisher, said, uh, Norman, what advice do you have for Conan about reviews? And I said to him, General, there's one thing you must remember. Thou shalt not kill. And uh, he laughed. He, you know, he's a charming man. He laughed a great deal at that one. Not a great deal, but enough. Um, some of your books have been terrifically successful and others less successful. Do you feel that it's a bit of a roller coaster? No, it's, so much of it depends on the timing and, and on many factors that have nothing to do with yourself. I would say that the reviews of my books have had more variation 
than the merit of the book. In other words, I'd like to think that my worst book is not that far away from my best book, that there's a certain level of performance. But the reviews would give you another impression. You've been a pretty macho figure, and you had um, a sort of fairly long run-in with the women's movement and with women writers uh, who accused you of writing about women as objects that were there for sort of... Well, I would say I, it's nonsense. They, they don't read me, so they don't know what they're saying. If they read my books, they'd realize that I'm making an honest man's attempt to understand women. And I do it without uh, prejudice and without, uh, without slant. I'm not interested in... Uh, I, I'm interested in getting to understand women. I, I think they're wonderfully uh, uh, interesting. Female characters fascinate me even more than male characters. And I try to have good ones. But did you think of women as always having different roles in life from men? Well, yes, I did. I mean, I grew up with a mother who adored me, so of course you start with that and, and, uh, and you move on from there. And uh, then you grow up and you realize when you get married that no woman's ever going to adore you like your mother. And, and so you better learn to understand a little more about women and what they want and what they need and, and, uh, and uh, whether, how evil are they, how good are they. This notion of the women's movement that women are good and men are evil is about as useful as uh, Hitlerism or communism or, or political correctness or any kind of uh, ideology that's uh, limited and constricting. But many men, I think, as women began to assert themselves uh, and claim uh, the right to the same roles as men, as writers, as executives, as leaders, and so on, instead of being confined to the role of housewife, many men felt threatened by that. Did you feel threatened by it? Well, of course, every man felt threatened by it who would <coughs> go on through the earlier period. The younger people are not bothered by it. My, my sons are not bothered by it. Uh, no, that was a change. But by the way, the women are going to pay tremendously for being able to wear those tailored suits and be executives because they're going to end up leading the miserable life of executives. I mean, the notion that men who are executives enjoy their lives is, uh, uh, leaves out of account the, the awful strain that's implicit in that. What have you learned from your wives? Oh, so much, so much. <clears throat> you know, one reason I'm fascinated with Picasso is he learned from every one of his wives and mistresses. And I have too. You, you didn't you know. treat them very well, did he? No, I've, I've treated my women to the degree you're able to treat women uh, much better than he ever treated his. But he was more of a son of a bitch than I am. As the 60s started, you wrote a famous piece about John Kennedy. What did you think of him when you first met him? Well, I think it was one of the um, more brilliant political perceptions I've had in that I saw he was going to change everything in American life. Because I reckon, after Eisenhower, I realized if we get a president who's young and handsome and of our generation, my generation, and he has a beautiful wife, that's going to change everything in American life. We were used to Harry Truman and his wife uh, to... Uh, but it changed nothing in American life. Oh, what come did it change on. in American life? It changed everything in American life. Then when he was assassinated, well, first of all, the country began to speed up and get, and, and sexual, the sexual revolution began with Jack Kennedy. No question of it. Things began to open up. We moved from the 50s into the 60s, and the 60s began to open. And then he was assassinated. The sexual and revolution that began with Kennedy because he looked so handsome? I mean, people didn't know uh, about him then what they know about him now. Absolutely. Don't you think... Look at, what, look at what England has gone through with the monarchy in the last five years, the, uh, adoring, or ten years, adoring the young couple, being disillusioned with it, turning, people turning sour because the monarchy has let them down, all that stuff. You, you, we're the same way in America. Our president is our central figure. His wife is enormously important to us. We, we like her, we don't like her, but we relate to, to the president and, 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 and the first lady in an extraordinarily intense fashion, almost as intense as the British do toward their monarchy. You said once that of America that you're still chasing after her true nature. Are you still chasing? Well, I uh, don't know. I don't know because the country's getting ugly, no question. It's getting damn ugly. Uh, we used to be a, a generous country, and we're getting very mean-spirited now. And it's our fault. It, it, it's because of all the bunkum of the Cold War, which went on about 20 to 30 years longer than it had to. I mean, the, the, if the Russians were ever, if communism was ever an evil empire, and Stalin was pretty evil, I'll grant, uh, it was an evil empire until he died. After he died, it became a third world country over a long period of time with a lot of ugly habits and a bad, oppressive country. But it was not the evil empire. It was a country that couldn't pave its roads. And uh, we pretended that it was a huge threat. And you know, you know, the greatest disaster America ever had was Ronald Reagan, because he spent $4 trillion, tripled the national debt, 
and gave us this myth that there was an evil empire we were fighting. And finally, you know, when the Cold War ended and George Bush took the credit for ending the Cold War, winning the Cold War, we didn't win it. We were just a huge bank that bankrupted a smaller bank because we had an arms race that wiped the Russians out. And, and so what happened is the Cold War ended. And here, now, suddenly, we were rather friendly with the Russians. And they really were rather nice people, weren't they? And so everybody in America, unconsciously, more or less, reacted with the feeling that they'd been swindled. Where was that enemy? All that hatred had been formally generated for generations in the Cold War. So now we all started hating one another in America. And we're an ugly country right now. I hope we improve, but I'm not all certain of that. You've led a very full life. Have you an un unrealized ambition? Ooh, I'm getting old enough so there are no more un really large, unrealized ambitions. I'd like to, there are a couple of books I want to write, uh, but other than that... Uh, are you going to write about your childhood? You said you would. No, when did I say I would? I won't get into that. I, if I said it, it was in passing. Uh, I don't want to write about my childhood unless I can say things about it that are more interesting than other writers have said about their childhood. And there's been some awfully good writing about childhood, so I don't know that I'm getting into that. You have to be inspired to write about childhood. What do you fear? What do I fear? Decrepitude. How would you like us to remember you? Well, he may have been a fool, but he certainly did his best. And that can't be said of all fools.